Well, when Broadway shuttered, he brought joy to millions of people in the industry when he celebrated an icon of Broadway. I'm Sam Ekman of Gold Derby, and I'm thrilled to be sitting here with Raul Esparza, the producer and host of Take Me to the World, a Sondheim 90th birthday celebration. It's so great to see you, Raul. Nice um, to see you too, Sam. You know, if we rewind a few months, Broadway unfortunately shuts down March 13th. Lots of productions uh, shut down in TV and film as well. And we think it's going to be a short thing, but now it's turned into a longer thing. And we get this Sondheim celebration, the birthday celebration in April. And I'm just curious what were, because it seems like such a daunting task to assemble this together with so many stars in it. What were the initial conversations about this piece? How did it sort of come to fruition? Um, one, if we had known what we were taking on, we would never have done it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was yeah. absolutely enormous. After the fact, I, I should have had my head examined. Um, what the initial conversation was about, uh, just the fact that when I'm not, it's not, I'm filming some series stuff here and there, but I'm not, I wasn't doing Broadway this season. I was doing a play off Broadway. But when Broadway closed, it really hit me hard it, because it's been home for so long. Mm -hmm. And um, I knew that there was going to be a, a birthday party for Stephen Sondheim on his birthday in March for the opening of Company, which is a show that's obviously very dear to me. And we were all going to be there and that that wasn't going to happen because the last place a man turning 90 should be, especially a legend like that, was at a giant gathering um, for an opening on Broadway. And as it became clearer and clearer that that wasn't going to happen and the celebration wouldn't happen, it occurred to us sitting around at home, just like, we should do something. And the first idea was, let's like put out some viral videos of just like Broadway stars singing um, Sondheim tunes and just kind of like, I don't know, high five each other and be like, hey, I sang this song, now you go. And then I thought, no, let's, what, what if we do a concert and create like a concert of like 10 of his most sort of iconic and uh, uh, celebrated performers doing a number, one of their numbers. Uh, I reached out to my great friend Mary Mitchell Campbell, who was my musical director and company, um, and she was talking about her uh, organization, ASTEP, which works with kids in the arts and kids de dealing in really disadvantaged uh, situations. And um, she said that they were in some serious trouble and that they'd probably be able to survive this, but she didn't know uh, about getting supplies and food and things to the kids mm -hmm. that they were working with. And I said, let's do an event. Let's create this concert and let's do it as a, ch as a charity for, for ASTEP. And then I reached out to my friend Paul at Broadway.com, uh, won't work, who ended up directing the piece. And um, I said, hey, would you stream this? And I think, uh, and he said, yes, let's do it. Now, we did this almost immediately that right after like the very end of March. And, and then we decided to wait. And I think that that was probably the smartest thing we did. Because at the point that we did this, I think Rosie O'Donnell was having a thing online mm -hmm. and there was gonna be a couple of things on television. And, and we just were like, you know, there's a lot of content coming out. Why don't we just wait? And, and take a month and, and think about how we want to do this and approach it. And I knew, we knew we wanted to reach out to certain friends, whether that was Audra or Cerberus or, or Patty Lupone, and, and be like, okay, there are some people who are deeply associated with him that we know. And uh, the first trick was to ask Steve if he was okay with this idea. <laughs> and at first he was like, well, okay, uh, <laughs> sure. Uh, he was actually really helpful and said, I will support you in any way you like. You know. Um, we had thought originally it should be called children in art or something mm -hmm. connected with the kids. We thought about could we get kids to perform from the A-STEP programs in India and in South Africa, in Homestead here in New York and the Bronx. But some of them are, um, they just didn't have the technology as the pandemic began to kick in more and more people couldn't get on cameras. Uh, some of them are the children of immigrants and they were afraid to appear on camera. So we mixed that idea. Um, and then all we had was the idea to just ask people to sing a song that inspired them, something that they loved of Steve's that they could give him as a gift for his birthday. And we would pull it together and Mary Mitchell Campbell would set keys with them and they would sing to that track. Yeah. And it just ballooned. <laughs> <laughs> it went from 10 to what you saw. Yeah. The other thing was Mary Mitchell had a beautiful idea, which was let's do um, uh, something with everybody from all the Broadway plays or all the Broadway musicals this season and get them to sing I'm Still Here because we're all stuck in our homes. Mm -hmm. That'd be funny and it could be like a separate thing. And so we knew we had that and I knew I wanted to ask Stephen Schwartz to play um, the prelude from Fall. Well, he suggested the prelude from Fall. I knew I wanted him to do something because Stephen is a very dear friend and I learned to play 
the music for Being Alive and Company when I was rehearsing for that production on Stephen Schwartz's piano. So I knew I wanted that. Um, and then I had the crazy idea to bring like the overture in, and I said, what if we do a whole overture? Yeah. <laughs> and it, it just ballooned. <laughs> yeah, you, well, it certainly ballooned. It seems like everyone who's ever touched a piece of Stephen Sondheim's work in their professional theater career is there in this um, concert. Was it challenging to get people on board or were people sort of clamoring to get in? The truth is it was really hard to write those asks, you know, the first mm -hmm. moments I was like, Oh boy, this is kind of a crazy thing I'm asking people to do. But the first people I asked, I think Patty was the first one to come back and say yes immediately. And she said, I'll do anyone can whistle. And then Cerberus wrote back and said, uh, I want to do Fishing Hat. Like, they were almost immediate. Um, and then other people started to come in, people I had worked with, and, and they didn't know exactly what they were getting into. <laughs> and they said, <laughs> okay, uh, sure. And uh, some emails I didn't have of for people that I knew and had worked with, but I just didn't have access to them. So I went through Steve to get a, a number of them. And um, and then those superstars started coming back, like 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 Donna and Bernadette and Meryl and, and uh, Mandy, and um, all, all of whom I know. But, uh, you know, uh, I felt, who am I? I must be mad to, to be asking these, these people. Mm -hmm. But people kept saying yes. They just kept saying yes. It was really, really wonderful. And it's a testament to how much they love him and yeah. how, how respected he is. And also, I began to feel the responsibility of what it means to have these legends on my hands and to take care of them. And, uh, and that, that was a big deal. Uh, Christine, for instance, was one that I associate so deeply with Steve's work. She's done so many of his workshops. And she was part of the Sondheim Celebration when I was part of it in 2002. And so she, we had worked together on Good Fight a few weeks earlier, and then everything halted on production for that. And I was like, I got to get Christine in here. What started to happen in terms of getting people at the end was that the people we couldn't include, the ones that, like Joanna Gleason had said yes to sing a song because she's a dear friend. And yet then she couldn't, she was editing a film. And so what could she do there? You know, uh, could Nathan sing or would Nathan speak? Then people started coming in and asking if they could do things. And it just, the time ran out. There are a full 10 performances, 12 performances I wish we could have included that we would love to share with people, but we just couldn't uh, make them happen fast enough. Right. One of the things I really appreciate about it too, um, is that you were saying like people weren't singing necessarily what they're known for in terms of Sondheim work, at least in every case. Um, like, you know, you'd expect certain people to sing the songs that they've done, which they've done in past uh, Sondheim birthday celebrations, because there's been other ones. Um, so I, I'm just curious, like, was there, a certain performance in there that kind of surprised you that you didn't expect someone to take on that really resonated with you? The first one that springs to mind is Katrina Lenk's Joanna. Mm. She, she said, I'm thinking about doing this and I, I had no idea what to expect. And then it showed up and it took my breath away. What she did just, it just blew, blew me away. Neil coming back with the, the witch's rap, <laughs> that was really surprising. And then one of my favorite moments was when Lynn Manuel turned in Giants in the Sky, because for a split second, if you watch Lynn closely enough, there's a little boy on screen and you just see the kid that fell in love with musicals doing that song for a second. And it's really, really moving. Uh, the killer for me in the whole evening is, uh, is uh, Chip Sign and, and what he does with, uh, uh, he, he said, I think I'll do no more. And I was like, okay. And then he just shattered us. <laughs> <laughs> with the, with the hat when he went and reached back and had yeah. the baker's hat there and told his stories. Um, Bernadette um, didn't do anything we talked about. Um, didn't uh, follow any of the music ideas. Didn't we, she just went rogue and sent me that perfect video which we didn't touch. And at the time we didn't know how we were going to end the concert. And when that came in, which was the very first video to come in, I said, "Well, that's that's uh, that's it. That's." Yeah. Uh, the other thing that really surprised me was that Merrily Overture. It astonished me because you have no idea how hard it is to get all those musicians in place. Those are all mm. pit musicians from Broadway and they're all playing alone in their homes. And that sounds like a, a studio recording. Um, so, um, but yeah, I, I, your first, my first thing that sprang into my head was Katrina. Mm. What a, a shockingly beautiful thing she created, like something suspended out of time.
Yeah, for you. And then there's, yeah. And then there was the big internet breaking moment. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think a lot of people, you know, the one that got the most attention, I would say, was the, the ladies' lunch. Did you oh, yeah. expect, because you kind of, a lot of them start with a title card, here's who's going to sing, but that you don't know it's going to be just Christine, and then, oh my God, Audra's here, and oh, here's Meryl. Did you expect that kind of reaction to that? Yes. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> we know that. We were like, this should, if this goes right, it'll play in every gay bar in perpetuity. <laughs> on musical Mondays. If this goes right, it'll enter, enter legendary territory. Um, the whole idea behind that was uh, uh, that Christine had told me about a dinner that she had had with Steve and Meryl and Audra, and that she thought it'd be fun. She always was like, I would love to revisit that that evening. And I had asked Meryl, and Meryl said yes very quickly, and then Christine came right back and said yes, and said, hey, why don't we do Ladies Who Lunch? And sort of make him laugh because he's lord knows he's heard that song enough times and we could just do something that he has never heard before at the time i don't think they realized that it was going to turn into what it turned into because nor did i because when the press release went out at first we weren't getting a lot of traction i think people just thought it was going to be um uh you know oh it's just going to be celebrities doing shout outs like hey i like steve sondheim and maybe some people would sing there was no sense that this was going to turn into what it turned into, but when the press release happened, and I think the fact that Meryl and Christine and Audra were sort of headlining, it just went global. And then they started to get nervous about what does that mean? What they thought of as like a fun joke for Steve was now going to be seen by everyone. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was one of those cases where I was like, oh, I got to take care of this extraordinary process. So we, and these women. And so we just started tossing around ideas and, and having long conversations and, you haven't lived until you're getting emails from Meryl and Christine <laughs> and phone calls from Audra at 11 o'clock at night. Uh, <laughs> and you're trying to figure out how to like put this thing together so that one, it honors the song, two, is fun, three, would make Steve laugh and would be uh, something that, that they would be proud of because mm. they're superstars. Right. You know, <laughs> like, right. exactly. that's a big deal. You've got to also take care of that. And nobody's used to the fact that we're suddenly doing our own lighting and there's no camera crew and there's no makeup and there's no hair. And we're, we're all like looking at ourselves and every bit of our insecurity is, is on screen. And so they decided they wanted to send up this sort of irreverent, almost Zoom call quality because they did a Zoom call to rehearse it. And they're like, we want to do that. So I brought uh, Mike Carnes on board from Marathon Digital who does stuff for uh, Hamilton. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Mike helped us make that video. We just created this thing. I remember when Meryl finally sent her take in, which she avoided sending in for days. And by the way, one take from Meryl. <laughs> Sounds right. <laughs> yeah, 32 from Christine. <laughs> because Christine's like in it working ideas and Meryl's like, I'm doing this. You know she's done 500 versions that she's not sharing, right? Um, right. But she's like, this is what I want. When that came in, I actually remember jumping up and down in the apartment, like, so that the neighbors complained. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, I, you know, something's happened to the zeitgeist of what it is that we were all going through that we could not have controlled. And the, the Zoom call of that was something we loved and something we thought mm -hmm. Steve would enjoy. And just doing that, making that be the thing that we worked on, ended up making other people happy that we could never have planned. You know, Sam, like, yeah. that, some magical thing happened in the world that turned that into such a special number because other people saw themselves in in them and and Audra was so willing to be like I'm just home with my hair undone and having a drink and Meryl was like screw it I'm in my bathrobe like all of those decisions were our decisions that we wanted to take care of the number but we could never have known that the cumulative effect of it would resonate the way it did with an audience that had been stuck at home for over a month we had like you can't plan that I want to ask you about your number as well, because, you know, when I think of you and Sondheim, I would obviously go to being alive, but um, that would be my, my for where my mind goes. But you did this beautiful version of the Evening Primrose song, Take Me to the World, the title of the show. What was behind that choice? What, what does that song mean to you? I just, um, I find the song um, sort of desperately hopeful. I find the song... Um, really full of yearning and love and sadness at the same time. And it's one of the Sondheim songs that has most moved me in, in my career and in my life. I associate it with pieces like, like it was from Merrily Roll Along or 
or lesson number eight from uh, Sunday, and it's a or uh, what can you lose from Dick Tracy? They are um, songs about uh, tension that I think is the epitome of what he writes both things at once. So here is a piece that has, I've just always found it so moving. The second those chords begin and the melodic line of, uh, of uh, just hold my hand. Da, 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 da. I just find it so piercingly beautiful. So I, I knew I wanted to sing it because I was also feeling like, take me to the world, man. Like I want to go outside. <laughs> so I want, I want to sing this beautiful song that is about, I, I miss New York. I miss the city. I miss the people. I wish we were outside. I wish. And Steve has actually said he does not like the solo version of that song, not mine necessarily, but that it's a duet. It's about a couple deciding to enter the world together, hold my hand. And uh, I always hold that in the back of my head because what, well, what does that mean? You, ha you have to play both things. You have to play the, I can do this. And yet you also have to play the knowledge that it's not going to work out. Yeah. And um, so it was, um, it was not going to be the title song originally. It was going to be either children in art or children will listen or something like that. Uh, but then, I don't know, we switched it. It ended up becoming Take Me to the World the whole night because we're getting so many different kinds of qualities and energies from artists coming in. And it felt like we were all scattered. And that night, too, I don't know if you've seen it. Have you seen that there's a trending map on Twitter for the hashtag for the concert from mm. that night? And you can slowly see the planet light up. It's, New York begins to glow at one point, right around the time of Ladies Who Lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, there's people in Africa and in Australia and in Malaysia and just lighting up around the world to Steve's music. Uh, it's really, really moving. So... That was also serendipitous. We didn't plan Take Me to the World, but that's exactly what the night turned out to be. And for me, it was a, just a very personal, it's a special secret um, treasure of a song for me. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, before I, I let you go, I wanted to also bring things back for a little bit and do a little rewind because you very impressively are one of only five people at the Tony Awards to be nominated in all four possible acting categories that an actor can be in for lead and featured in a play, lead and featured in a musical. So you're in great company with Audra. Um, what, what is the experience like of, of getting to be a part of that night? So the said. Tonys? Yeah. You know, the first time it was um, kind of an outer body experience with Taboo. I remember feeling like, what am I doing here? I don't belong here. This is crazy. Um, trying to be cool, but not feeling very cool. I was doing the normal heart at the time at the public and mm -hmm. Taboo had long ago closed and I felt uh, outside of the whole event and I was with Michael Service one that night and he's a friend and Dennis O'Hare was sitting behind me and he was nominated as well. The whole thing felt like a, a celebration among friends that, I mean, you hope you win, but still it's like, wow. Uh, my Spanish teacher from high school, Beatriz Jimenez, who's been one of the great influences in my life, was uh, one of my guests that night at the Tonys, my, my main guest. And she walked down the aisle and looked at me at Radio City and we had had no theater program whatsoever in my high school. She and I had started one. We used to do plays in Spanish in my school in Miami at Belen. And we created a program. We created a, a whole club of like literature and photography and humanities and acting and art. And she stood in the aisle at Radio City and looked at me. And then she just looked around Radio City and then looked back at me. <laughs> and I was like, okay, like, how is this possible? So that is all the one that always pops into my head. Um, company was an out-of-body experience for a different reason. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, one of the biggest things I learned with company is that your performance is as good as your performance is and the show is as great as it is. And no award makes or breaks what, um, what you've done. You still have to do that job. And uh, we, we won the Best Revival uh, Tony Award for that and that production began in a basement in Cincinnati so there was this extraordinary sense of look what we've accomplished and um, the awards themselves are as much of a celebration of the individual accomplishments as they are of the whole community and you know I, I, awards are tricky because how do you rate sort of apples and oranges everybody has different skills and you say he's best no she's best no she's best it seems mad but ultimately what's happening on those evenings is this sense of we're all part of this. And when my brain got around that idea, when I began to understand, not the treadmill of like, how do I campaign for a prize? How do I let people know I'm here? 
What is it important to show up for? Will I win? Will I win? Not that treadmill, which is human and normal, but the realization of, wait a minute, stop and take a second and look at where you are, this thing you always dreamt you'd be part of. Then the awards become um, something very special and you can't take it for granted. Like this season, I was doing um, an off-Broadway play, seared and got a lot of nominations yep. for that show. And there was nowhere to take all that joy. And I was yep. like, hey, I really miss it. I, I'm not going to take it for granted what awards ultimately mean and can do. And for me, the fact that I also have gotten the nominations for plays is a very special thing because you, when I began at least 20 years ago, Jesus, here in New York, it wasn't that easy to go back and forth between musicals yeah. and plays. You know, well, so it's a big deal. Well, uh, it's great that you can continue to bring joy uh, and did continu continue to bring joy with this Sondheim uh, birthday celebration. Uh, so we're all very thankful for that. And everyone Thank who's you. watching, make sure you subscribe to Gold Derby. Keep in touch with us throughout any season with all of our updates. Raul, thank you so much. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you. It's nice to talk to you too.